Welcome to the Digital Pathology Place. I'm Alexandra Zhurav, and if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing. This is a video recording of a podcast I did with Andrew Janovchik. Andrew is a computer scientist working in the field of digital pathology for quite some time already, and he is also the author of the open source software HistoQC for quality control of HME slides. So have a listen, and I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, today my guest is Andrew Janovchik, and I'm pronouncing this uh, with my Polish pronunciation because it's a Polish name. I it is a Polish last name, yeah. But you can later say how you pronounce it. And Andrew is a computer scientist and a researcher at uh, Case Western Reserve and Lausanne University Hospital. And uh, he has been active in the field of digital pathology since 2008 and is an author of an, of an open source uh, software, HistoQC. Hi, Andrew. It's great to have you on the podcast. How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm doing quite good today. Great. So tell us about yourself. I gave a little introduction, but tell us what's your background and how did you end up in the field of digital pathology? So I think uh, I've been quite fortunate. I've had a very uh, interesting path in order to, to get here. So uh, initially I studied computer science and, and applied mathematics at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York. Uh, I also received my master's degree there in computer science. Afterwards, I actually moved to Alaska for about three months where I was a salmon fisherman. Uh, after that, I moved to Vienna, Austria, where I worked in the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency. And I wrote the software that inspectors use to verify material at the different uh, nuclear sites around the world. So I was one of the, the developers of that. I was, I was quite junior at that time, so I don't want to take too much credit there. Um, after that contract, I moved to China and taught English for about eight or nine months. Uh, then I started working for a large oil company where we built a billion dollar oil facility in the Nigerian jungle. So I lived in Nigeria for a while. Uh, I lived in Germany, in Hamburg for a while. Um, then my life kind of took a little bit of a, a twist. A, a very close family member of mine was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer. Um, and and she's, she's fine now. Um, but I realized that there's probably other things I could and should be doing with my life. So I quit my job. I moved to India, to Mumbai, and I received my PhD there in computer science and electrical engineering, I believe is the topic. And that's actually where I started my digital pathology research. So since then, in I've India. basically been, been been on that train. Yeah. Oh Interestingly enough. That's Fantastic that's weather. Sure is a... a crazy story to get to yeah. the pathology i don't think i have heard a story like this before and yeah, that's it it was fun <laughs> and you're originally from where i'm originally from long island new york from the u.s okay so how do you pronounce your last name uh we pronounce it janowick which is, okay. i think is a very americanized uh, version of that it's the americanized version <laughs> correct <laughs> okay well that is indeed a crazy story mm, so we said where you're working, what are you doing there now? So I think our, our work basically focuses on, on two components, really. Um, one of them I think we'll discuss later, and you mentioned this, is HistoQC. Mm -hmm. So some component of, uh, of our work is to build tools that make digital pathology research easier. Uh, so that's basically the idea that we have a lot of experience. As you mentioned, I've, I've been doing this since 2008. And we have a lot of things hanging around. We have a lot of experience. We have a lot of small scripts and little tips and tricks and, and basically experience that you build up over, over the years. So some component of that is to try and take that and, and turn it into tools that encode that experience. So people that are less experienced can still obtain great results without having to, for example, spend 10 years going and studying the field. So one of my main goals really is, is what I call like this democratization of digital pathology such that people anywhere can get involved with it and to kind of lower that bar for entry such that they don't need to be, uh, we'll say, especially skilled or, or have access to, let's say, a digital pathology lab or have access to high performance computing clusters. Question is, what can we do to, to make it such that everyone can now work on this topic and, and make it more approachable regardless of what their uh, surroundings are? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the first component of, of our, our research. The second component of our research is more in the biomarker discovery field, where we actually want to go and look at patients 
and their digital pathology slides and try and, for example, in the context of cancer, predict the progressiveness of their disease, how aggressive that disease might be. As well, we're very interested in trying to predict therapy response. So for example, you might know immune therapy is, is a very hot topic now and, and it, it has great results for some patients, but not all patients. Mm -hmm. It turns out a, a, a percentage of those patients in fact, experience near life-threatening complications as a result of, of taking that therapy because their body essentially just starts to attack itself uh, very aggressively to the point where the, the person is close to death and they have to intervene in order to, to stop that from happening. We don't know ahead of time where those patients are, which, which of those patients are, which the ones that are going to respond well, which are not going to respond well, and, and which are going to have an, what we would consider a very poor response. So our, our hypothesis is that by looking at digital pathology slides, there may be certain characteristics, features, presentations of disease, um, tissue microenvironment components that we can very precisely quantify that allow us to predict which patients are in each of these categories uh, ahead of time. So I see both of these facets, the tool building and the biomarker discovery as, as kind of going hand in hand. As we learn more in our, let's say, biomarker work, where we're really using the most cutting state of the art type technology and, and we fail a lot, right? I mean, research is a lot uh, about trying and failing. So we fail a lot and say, oh, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work. And that's okay because we have the experience to do that and, and our failures tend to happen very quickly on the order of, let's say a few days or a few weeks. But then as soon as we identify something that does work that we think is generalizable, the goal is to then translate that into a tool where we say, hey, this is gonna work 95% of the time. Now inexperienced people that would require six months or a year to, to have that failure, now first of all, don't have that failure. And second of all, can use that tool immediately to get where they need to be in order to start doing the types of research that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So democratization of pathology. This is interesting because I have heard this concept from computer scientists. They kind of recognize the value of uh, their contributions to this field and want to make it accessible to other people. Um, I think we pathologists look at it from, from the other end. So it's like we want the tools. We are the people who, who, who want this. So yeah, that's very interesting. And obviously biomarker discovery, like you said, is a hot topic and um, high rate of failure. So if we have tools to accelerate that, like in the whole drug development, if you fail quickly, like you said, uh, you're, you are ahead of the curve. Yes. Yeah. And I think that there's some, some concepts there given, and, and this is one of the, the nice things about being involved in what I would consider highly translational, but also a highly collaborative science is that every field brings with it its own best practices and its best uh, experiences. So one thing that I, I've seen in, in my own lifetime during my, my career, really, if I can be really concretize that in that period of time, is when we first started, very few people released their source code uh, for the tools that they were developing. So as a result, during my PhD, for example, I would read a, a paper and then I would spend three months trying to implement this paper because ultimately the written form of that algorithm is quite different than the implementation itself. The written form is more of a general idea while the exact nuance and the details that are needed are trial and error. And of course, the author of that paper doesn't go and have an appendix where they say, here's the 55 small variables. If you use 0.0001, it doesn't work. But if you use 0.00012, it does work. And you have to go and discover those things yourself. And that was expensive in terms of, of time, in terms of cost, and in terms of effort. So during my lifetime, we've seen the, what I think the, the benefit of, for example, working with computer science folks is they say, well, we do open source. We know what open source looks like. We know how to share code. We know how to package code and write readme files and uh, how to put things in a nice structure so that someone else with a similar background is, is more easily able to digest it. And within my lifetime now, any super impactful paper that you see, almost all of them come with code. Where they say, you don't believe my results? Go download it and try it yourself. Because there was always this discrepancy where you would go and try and program someone's work from a paper, then you'd meet them at a conference and say, oh, I tried it, but it didn't really work. And they say, well, how did you do it? Oh, I did it like this. Oh, actually, I meant it like this. So there's, there's so much variability where I don't know if it just doesn't work because I've implemented it differently than they intended, or does their algorithm just not work on my specific data set, or, or where's this disconnect? 
Now, once we've released the code, we say, this works on this data. Here's the code, here's the data, try and redo it yourself. And you can, you click run, you wait sometimes a few hours, sometimes a few minutes, sometimes a few days, you come back, wow, this did work on this. Okay, I now know that something is working. That is extremely useful because especially in the context of, the context of digital pathology, I can go and say, how difficult is it for me to replace their data with my data? Oh, you're using whole slide images? I'm using whole slide images. Let me put in my data. Now I'm in a position where I can simply just quickly replace their data with my data, click run on something that I know already works on their data, right? So one of those variables is now completely removed. Does it work? Yes, I know it works. That's removed. Now the question is, does it work on my data? The unique variable there is my data. I click run. If it works, fantastic. I've, I've potentially just saved on the order of, of years of effort trying to, to get to that point. And biomedical engineers, and I think medical doctors before, weren't, they were aware of the concept, but maybe they didn't know how necessarily to do that in the, in the best ways possible, and weren't exactly sure of where the boundaries were. So I imagine if you're a medical doctor, you're, you're, you are, are sworn to some level of, of confidentiality. You're not going to go and say, well, here's my data set. I'm just going to put it out on the internet with all your patient names and their addresses and their phone number. Like that's, that's obviously completely uh, illegal and, and ethically wrong as well. So a question then is say, well, what is the minimum amount of data that, that's needed to be released that still is useful for the community, but also respects the privacy that's needed for the, the patients? And I think a lot of the medical doctors really never asked themselves that question because they didn't understand what data was actually needed to do this type of research. So through these collaborations, they said, oh, wait, all you need is the image data and I can strip away this, this, this. Yes, yes. Oh, they're like, oh yeah, I can easily get approval for that. Give me a few days. And then they'll go and they'll, they'll go through the process in their hospital and, and voila, now you have these extremely large, beautiful data sets that are very useful and, and rich, uh, more rich than we could develop on, on our own. But they didn't know that they should do that. And at the same time, they didn't know how to do it properly. So only through these, let's say, large collaborations are we able to combine all of these insights and all of these knowledge to actually make things viable for people to use at scale. Mm -hmm. So regarding the collaborations, have you been at those institutions from the beginning of your digital pathology path or did you switch? Um, so initially I started, as I mentioned, in uh, India and in, in Bombay. Mm -hmm. um, my advisor there, Professor Sharat Chandran, actually met Anat Madhubushi at a conference a few weeks uh, before I joined the, their PhD program. So I went and spoke with Sharat and I was like, oh, I'm interested in doing cancer image detection type stuff. He's like, to be honest, Andrew, I don't really have a lot of experience in that. My experience is in image analysis, but not the digital pathology component. But I just met Anat. You should, you should contact him and maybe he can be a co-advisor. So uh, I contacted Anat and, and we've been working together. I think we actually just celebrated our, our 10 year anniversary uh, last year. So I've been working with Anat for, for a long time uh, because he, he, is, he is fantastic to work with. I, I really have nothing, nothing negative to say in the slightest there. Um, so he was at Rutgers at the time. So I remotely essentially worked on projects with him there. And then uh, in the last, I don't know, maybe five or six years, it's difficult for me to remember, uh, he moved over to Case Western uh, where I also transitioned with him. Um, so we continue to work there. And then the Lausanne in, in Switzerland, Switzerland is starting, I would say, on this digital pathology uh, revolution as well. So um, I've started working there with uh, more people and we're, we're starting some projects. It's, it's, it's more, I would say, uh, in its infancy as the infrastructure that's needed, for example, the digital slide scanners and figuring out how to uh, correctly submit ethics reports for um, approval and those types of things are, are figured out. Mm -hmm. I ask this because uh, I wanted to know if this knowledge that you have developed um, is within the same institution or is it fragmented? It looks like it's within the same team. Uh, you have had uh, Anat as your collaborator for so many years, so I guess it also travels with you. The other thing um, to comment on the open source. So um, in parallel to what's happening in the, uh, like you said, with the source code in the publication, Currently, I have noticed that now you can see uh, as an appendix whole slide images with the um, with the, the markups of the image analysis, which was not the case before. Before, yes. it was, you know, mm -hmm. you pick the best picture you have or the best uh, zoomed in fragment of the picture mm -hmm. you have. You put it in the paper and this is your proof of concept that it worked. <laughs> Slightly biased, potentially. Slightly biased. <laughs> uh, I learned very quickly working in the digital pathology company not to believe screenshots, um, but now you don't have to believe screenshots. 
I mean, not everyone is doing this yet, but this is a trend also on our pathology side to include the whole slide images with all the mark markups. People can see, um, you know, without uh, having the computer background to just see, okay, does it, mar uh, does it match the morphology in the tissue? So if you think about the reason why that's possible now, a lot of it has to do simply with technological development. So for example, um, when we first started research, you would try and go and buy a hard drive to hold the whole slide image. The size of a whole slide image has not fundamentally changed in the last 10 years. They've always been about one gigabyte or two gigabytes, wh whatever it is. But the cost for storing that has, has changed. So previously you would buy a, a 10 gigabyte hard drive. It would be $500 or whatever it is. You'd be able to store 40 slides on it and, and that would be it, right? You, you would have to process and save it on this, this comparably very small hard drive, and, and that was it. So the idea, and, and as well at the same time, the internet was much slower then, right? People didn't have fiber and things like that. So you were in a situation where now you have multiple gigabytes of data that you need to transfer to someone over, let's say, a dial-up connection. You, you know, you're looking at 55 years of transfer time and $2,000 just to store this data on the other side, which makes it not feasible. Now we have things like Amazon Cloud and cloud storage, which is super cheap. You can buy hard drives and set up your own server, which are super cheap. We, we go and experience upload speeds to Amazon from, from Case Western because they're both on that fiber backbone. It's like 60, 70, 80 megabytes a second. So you're able to upload slides in, in minutes instead of years, really. It's, it's really that, that order of, of difference. So the, I don't think people intentionally didn't want to share their slides or share their information or, or those sort of things before, but the cost associated with doing it, both in, in time and, and money, it was just insurmountable. It was just not feasible to run a digital slide server at scale 10 years ago. And now a high school student could realistically set it up on a very modest budget and it, it'll work. It'll work and, and do what it's supposed to do. So there, it's, it's, I don't, I'm not even sure how much of it's been people's desire to change, just that I think maybe people have always wanted to do it. I certainly have. Uh, maybe I don't speak for everyone, but I, I certainly have. But now it's feasible. Now they'll say, how much is it going to cost us to release the data? Oh, it's going to cost $10 a year on Amazon. Okay, fine. That's, that's a rounding error. Like no one, it's, it's such an insignificant amount that, and I think you're pointing out the more impactful the paper, the, the fact that you release that data makes it more impactful as opposed to now, if you don't release that data, it actually limits the impact. So there's even further benefit, I think there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think the same. It was not intentional, and it uh, even you know if it was uh, little screenshots and just little tiny peeks into what was happening at that point, uh, it helped drive it forward. And now we can see everything, and now we can verify everything. Mm, let's go back to the concept of open source. Can you tell the listener what is open source or what is open source software and a little bit about this initiative and the idea behind it? So I think open source is, it, it kind of makes sense if you think about it in the context of working with a lab. So you'll go and work on a project and maybe you work on that project with three or four different people and everyone is contributing different po components to that, to that project. The idea of open source software is really that, but I would say at, at a global scale. So a lot of the, the similar ideas and the best practices and um, how to go about doing it follow basically that, um, that, that paradigm where you have an idea, you want to share it with other people, uh, and you also want them to be able to contribute. You want them to be able to improve upon your idea, or even in some cases to maybe radically change your idea or, or take a component that you've developed and say, I fundamentally disagree with how you've used that. I'm going to go and make something else that's, that I perceive to be much better without negatively impacting your, your work. And, and that's possible through basically sharing this code. And it's slightly different than we'll say, I email an author and say, hey, can I have the source code for your, for your program? And, and we've done that over, over the course of many years and people do it to, to us as well. And, I would say 99% of the time people say yes, right? One of, the, one of the concerns has always been, you don't want to put random stuff on the internet uh, without any type of control over it. Um, so if people ask you and you say, oh, they're from a, a university, this is obviously a university student, you're, you're very likely to give them the, the source code uh, because you, you've been in a similar position as them. Now the idea is, well, what does that control actually get you? What is the worst thing that can happen if someone goes and has access to this sorting algorithm? Like the worst thing that could happen is people use it, 
right? That's, that's, the, that's the worst. In fact, maybe the worst thing that could happen is people don't use it. Where you go and you, you go and you, you write, you spend hundreds of hours on this, and then you find out there's no interest in it. That, that's probably the worst thing that could happen. So a lot of the ideas, uh, especially in an academic circle where we're not really intending to, let's say, commoditize these or, or it would be difficult to commoditize and productize some of these things, it's easier to open source it so people can actually start to use it and provide you feedback in hopes of making it better. And there's still room for, I would say, intellectual property. So there's you can have a patent on something and still open source it and, and still retain some control over it. Um, the licensing that you have um, can, can decide whether or not other people can take your code entirely or they need to cite your code or what the circumstances are that they can, they can use that particular code. Maybe the most forgiving license is one where you can literally release a project and someone else can productize it and sell it and not write a single line of code. But the question then is, hey, well, if someone has a free version of that and someone has a paid version of that, why would that person go and take that paid version? So clearly, if that person is going to go and, and make some money, they would have to add some value to that. And the, the price that the people are willing to pay is going to be based off of what their perceived added, perceived value of that added value is. And that sounds like a fair fair market to me, right? People can decide, oh, I, I don't actually need that service. I need these, these other components. As well, the open source paradigm is quite interesting because what we're seeing at the same time is people building consulting companies around open source software. So we can discuss HistoQC, but we have a, a, a very defined scope, I think, of what we want HistoQC to do and the features that we are interested in implementing. We, of course, receive requests from, from people in the community, and yes, we're happy to, to, to answer them and see if they're interested to us and, and we have the, the, the power to do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it, right? So, so there's, there's obviously a lot of potential synergy there where if you want something and I want to do that something and I didn't think about it, I'll, I'll do it for you, right? It, it's now, I'll, I'll pull it into my scope and say, this is now my job, I'll take care of it. There's other things though, which are perhaps radically different that HistoQC could be used for that are not within our scope and would, would basically spread us too thin uh, if we try and implement every single thing. Let's say you really, really want that though, as a, as a pathologist. Let's say you really, really want a specific feature, but it's unique to your unique institution. So there's no one else in the world that would gain value from us implementing that. I'm sorry, but we'll have to look at that and say, listen, it's not, we, we have other things that we would like to implement that would, that would benefit more people more greatly than a single niche thing. You would, if we had a closed source product, you would be stuck. You would say, well, this, this product just doesn't do what I want it to do. Uh, I'll have to suffer quietly. Another option now is that you can hire a consultant and say, here's an open source tool. Here's all of the source code. Here's the documentation of how the tool works. I want you to go and add this feature and I will pay you X amount to do that. Now a consultant can go and say, oh yeah, absolutely. I will, I'm a computer programmer, we'll say. I have read the source code. I understand the source code. It's well documented. It makes sense to me. I, you've given me some data to test it on. I will go and implement this for you at this rate per hour. And that's something that they can work out themselves. Now there's an opportunity where that pathologist can get what they want. Of course, they'll have to pay for it. I, I think that seems fair. And at the same time, that pathologist now has that, that code. That pathologist can also opt to make that code open source. So in fact, they could pay for a feature and say, well, I know no one else needs it in its exact form, but maybe other people could benefit from 10 minutes of modification from it. They could also opt to open source it, either through their own, we'll say GitHub repository, or they can send it to us and we can include it in a third party contribution uh, folder that we say, we don't maintain this, but this is here in case, as an example in case you want to do this. So open source goes and creates this opportunity for lots of different people of different backgrounds to work together to improve something, while if it was completely closed source, it's, it's basically stuck it, in that it's frozen in time. It's frozen in time and, and it's only that person that, that owns it can benefit from it in that context. Mm -hmm. So what does HistoQC do? <laughs> Ah uh, yes. What yes, is probably... it for, and who is it for? Yeah, so maybe we should have maybe we should have tackled that one in a reverse order. Um, so histo, so I, I, maybe I'll start with why why histoQC came around. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, one of our major works is to try and do biomarker discovery. Right, that's that's what we're interested in, in doing. And to do great biomarker discovery, you need to have a large number of slides. Right, you need to have a sufficiently powered data set in order to be able to detect the particular effect that you're. Uh, interested in detecting. So I had this idea for a study and I said, you know, I'm going to use the TCGA data, which you might know of the Cancer Genome Atlas. They have, I think it's about 10, 100,000 or 300,000 slides now uh, available of different cancers um, at different stages, 
fairly well annotated, beautiful, rich data source. So I said, I'm going to use the TCGA data. So I downloaded about a thousand um, breast cancer uh, whole slide images, and I started to look through them and realized that the quality was more variant than than realistically anything I had seen at that point. Glad you mentioned that. I don't think people know that about the TCGA data set. And the, one of the challenges is, of course, that TCGA, which is really a, the, the the component that we're talking about, is, is it's called a DPR or digital pathology repository. But that that DPR is multi institutional, and that's why there's variability in in these slides. Because someone that made slides in New York doesn't necessarily make them the same way in California, doesn't necessarily make them the same way as someone in Michigan, just because of, let's say, small staining times, um, this particular stains that they use, the stainer, the machine that itself that they use, and, and everything affects it, right, slightly. For example, the temperature in the room, the humidity in the room, all of these have some type of a chemical component effect on the underlying stain, which affects the ultimate presentation. Thankfully, the TCGA all uses the same scanner, but if you go to larger slide repositories, every institution may have a different scanner. This is also going to go and impart some, some differences in, in brightness, differences in contrast, white balance. So when you get these, these, all these samples together, the variability is ginormous. It's huge. As well, at the same time, the TCGA was originally developed to facilitate molecular discoveries, not digital pathology discoveries. Right, so that's an important distinction because when they were making this, they focused very heavily on, let's say, the mutation calling, the methylation data, the copy number variation, they, all of these omics data, and they did a great job in the quality control there. The digital pathology slides were just an extra, basically, where they said, "Well, we have this slide anyway because they'll they'll scan the slide before they do the sequencing because sequencing is expensive, making a slide is not expensive, and they want to make sure there's actually tumor." on what they're about to sequence. So they can go and now they'll make an H&E slide, they'll look at it, they'll estimate how much, uh, what the tumor purity is and say, oh, if the tumor purity is zero, we're not gonna sequence it. So they've, they've saved a few, a few thousand dollars there and they'll keep going until they find a sample that they like. And then they provided those digital pathology slides as essentially as a service to say, this is what that RNA data looks like in disease presentation. Just in case you're interested, this is what it looks like. So then if you have some questions about, oh, this RNA, I wonder how many lymphocytes were there. You can now look at the H&E the, the &E slide and, and come up with a rough estimate. So that was the original purpose of that. Then folks like myself came along and said, well, we can do computational analysis on these. Of course, everyone was very open and, and loved this idea because it makes sense, the data's there, why not use it? But the challenge is that that data wasn't very well quality controlled before it was put onto that repository because no one had initially intended for it to be computationally analyzed. So ultimately, if you're going to go and do something, if you know you're going to go and do something, you're going to build a standard to that thing that you want to do. If you don't know you're going to do it, then you're just like, well, I'm just going to do it. You know, what, what, I'll bake a cake. doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's going to be a cake, right? But if you say, I need a cake that has exactly these properties, now you think about how do I get these, these particular properties. And at that time, they didn't do that. So we end up with a very varying quality of, of data. The way that we typically went and, and would do this when, for example, when I did my PhD, our data sets were much smaller. We would have maybe 30 patients. 30 patients is, an, is small enough that I would manually open each and every slide. I would find any artifacts in there, for example, a crack on the cover slip, tissue folding, blurriness, um, overstained regions, regions that were too thickly cut, whatever it was. I would manually go and look at each and every single slide, and I would sit there with a digital pen and circle the regions that were good for computation. Right, so that means that they're, we'll say they're artifact free and they're of high quality. And that would take about an afternoon, we'll say with 30 slides. Now when we start going and downloading TCGA data, it's, it's more noisy than slides that were made specifically for computational study, while at the same time, you have thousands of slides. So it's no longer possible for me to go and say, I'm gonna open up 5,000 slides and quality control all of them and manually go and identify where the blurry regions are or where the cracks are. It's just not feasible anymore. I realized that as I started to do that process. I went and I annotated five of these images. I'm like, this, this is just done. not scalable. Yeah, I'm like, forget <laughs> it. This is, this, is, this is never going to finish. I'm going to die before I finish analyzing these, these slides. Then I realized at the same time that we had tons of code that did various parts of this, right? So we have like very basic blur detectors just to identify blurry regions. Um, we have some, some of these little scripts floating around. So the idea was, why don't we codify this 
and solidify it into a tool that's actually usable instead of little pieces of MATLAB. Some of it's in Python. You know, we have some of it was in C++, all just kind of floating around. Why don't we take the time? We'll do this properly. We'll organize all of our experience, even beyond the code, try and imagine what the different types of quality control failures are, and we'll build a tool specifically for that. Uh, and that's why HistoQC came about. So in the end, what HistoQC does is you can provide it with whole slide images, and it will identify where on the slide there are artifacts, like cracks, like pen markings, like tissue folding, regions that are too dark, regions that are too light. It'll identify those and mask all of those out for you and give you a binary mask that says these are the good regions for, um, uh, for computation. At the same time, it will go and produce metrics that measure the properties of that slide. For example, how bright the image is, or uh, how, sorry, how bright the tissue is. So we'll go and extract all of the background and all of that stuff. And when we, when we have finished doing all of the artifact detection, that mask that's left is just tissue. From that tissue, now we'll go and extract color metrics. How bright is this? How is it overstained? Is it up, understained? Um, what is the hue? What is the saturation? Very kind of first order statistic type stuff. And it turns out once you start doing that, you are able to go and group images by quality and you're able to even identify batch effects inside of them using just very, very simple statistical properties. And that's something that's extremely important, especially in the context of, of what I would consider uh, these new deep learning paradigms, because deep learning, while on one hand it has the power to learn of a, a specific disease presentation is associated with uh, a, a more aggressive type of disease. At the same time, deep learning has the ability to learn this slide, all of the patients that have a good prognosis have a very light slide, and all of them that have a bad prognosis have a very dark slide. So then during test time, if you give it a light slide, it's like, oh, it must be a bad prognosis, and having not studied any bit about the actual disease presentation itself. So we, in order to kind of develop better classifiers, we need to have an understanding of what potential batch effects may be present within there. And HistoQC now goes and provides metrics, a, a set of them. I mean, it's, it's not, let's say, all-inclusive, maybe about 30 or 40 of them, where you can go and try and predict the likelihood of a batch effect um, from a specific lab, we'll say. And then that's going to go and help inform you how to make better uh, experiments later on. At the same time, we're, we work with Michael Feldman on that, who uh, works at University of Pennsylvania. He's the, the head of the pathology department there. Uh, and he's a co-investigator on the, the NCI grant that funds the development of HistoQC. And his idea, coming at it from a pure pathology perspective, or, or we'll say even a lab manager perspective, he wants to HistoQC every single slide as it comes out of the scanner, simply because he wants to know immediately two things. One, if that slide is of poor quality for some reason, because then if it is, they can immediately address that problem. So instead of waiting for that tissue block to get put back into the repository, the slide eventually makes it to his desk. He looks at it and says, I can't use this slide because it's of such poor quality. Then you have to retrieve the tissue block from wherever, recut this. I mean, you're talking about days of delay. Now it'll come right out of the scanner. Immediately, you'll have a red flag that HistoQC says, hey, this is probably a bad slide. And you say, okay, uh, let me take a look at that slide. Oh, this is a bad slide. Let me remake it right now while all of the material is physically in my hand. So you, you immediately experience a, a boost of efficiency there. At the same time, he would like to know what the pattern over time of his lab is. So for example, in the beginning of the month when you have new stains, maybe those stains stain more darkly. As you get towards the end of the month, maybe those stains have started to oxidize, they don't stain as well. Well, if you have quantitative metrics that measure the output of those slides each and every single day, hundreds of times per day, you now essentially can have a quality control process where he can go in and say, I'm willing to accept one standard deviation away from this metric. If a slide, if five slides in a row are produced that are too dark by this metric, I want to receive a, a page immediately and I want to shut the lab down to address that problem. And I want to address it after five slides instead of at the end of the month after 50,000 slides. So now you have this quality control, which is, which is very common, for example, in building cars or building buildings or building little small parts or building iPhones. Everyone else has a quality control process that's quantitative where you say, I'm going to try this phone. Did it work? Yes. Okay, go to the next one. Did it work? Yes. This one didn't work. Okay, one bad phone out of every thousand is okay. As soon as you get to 10 phones, they shut down the factory and they figure out this is, this is way too high. Why is that? Now that we have digital pathology, we're transitioning from this analog science to a digital science. It enables us to use these same quality control and standard practices that other digital fields have been able to do 
uh, over the years. Now we can finally start to apply them. And I think HistoQC also fits that niche to, to help address the challenges there. Mm -hmm. So you said the worst thing that can happen to an open source thing is that nobody uses it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> How many people use it? How popular is it? So that's a great question. It's actually the, the challenge, I think, with open source in particular with HistoQC is that it's very difficult for us to know how many people use it. Um, uh -huh. Other products, well, I, I don't want to consider projects, we'll say projects. Other projects have different abilities to keep track of their users. So a good way of keeping track of users is you have, let's say, a software tool, and the software tool, when it starts up, it goes in it. Uh, pings a server somewhere to say, hey, I'm a new installation. And a lot of open source tools will do that so they have at least an estimate of how many people have uh, installed this, this particular file. Because keep in mind, you only need to download it once, but if I go to a hospital and install it 50 times, that, that, that has a different, that, that shows up in a very large uh, impact of difference. Unfortunately, HistoQC can't use that type of a mechanism because it's designed specifically to work with non- uh, sorry, with confidential data, and as a result, we don't have any components that connect with the internet at all. So it's designed to work entirely on a standalone machine without any interface with 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 anyone else, basically. Um, so we lose a lot of options as a result of that. While a lot of things like, for example, Microsoft Word, they know how many people use Microsoft Word, right? Mm -hmm. So. Specific projects due to specific constraints don't have, have different ways of measuring this. I think a good way that we were able to measure it, I, I guess, is two components. One is that uh, we see citations for the paper that we use. So as people put out publications in, in academic settings, hopefully, uh, if they've used our tool to quality control their data, they'll, they'll make reference to, to our tool. And of course, we would appreciate that. That doesn't necessarily work in, in labs themselves that don't, let's say, public, uh, publish papers in, in the public. Another way that we can keep track of it is we see how many people ask about it. So, for example, I get probably five emails a month from different people all over the world that are saying, hey, I'm trying to use this tool. Um, I, this isn't really working for me. This is working for me. How do I do th these sort of things? Um, so we kind of try to gauge it from there. GitHub has the ability to keep track of some statistics. So if you make a release, you can see how many people have downloaded that release. So there's, there's different metrics, but I have no idea. I think the, really. the ultimate one is I have I have no idea more than more than ten less than ten thousand. Okay, um, so why did you do it open source? I mean, building code for people who don't build code—it's the software uh, business principle. And now the digital uh, pathology industry is booming with different image analysis companies, uh, slide management companies, anything that you have to do around the slides without knowing how to code. I don't think anything is really addressed in the quality control space. Um, I think it's a little bit, okay, every company develops for themselves. They want to have high quality data, but um, it's not something that goes out to the users. This is the only thing that is solely dedicated for this that I have heard of, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, why did you not want to commercialize it? I mean, you had the idea. I know now it's a part of a grant and, um, you know, the bigger infrastructure that, uh, I mean, you still can take it and do some other things, add to it and commercialize. What was the reason why you didn't do it, why you didn't want to do it? So I, there was a very similar question when we released this tool at uh, ECDP in, in Helsinki a, a number of uh, years ago. I think it was maybe 2018. Um, and, and I don't think my response to that has changed. I wanted to release it open source just to fundamentally change the world. I wanted to change the way that we, we enacted digital pathology as a science. And one of the problems with science, I guess one of the one of the problems with digital pathology science versus other sciences is that we don't take measurements. And as soon as we start taking measurements, we have the ability to do better. And that's, that's this idea, right? There's this old, old saying, and, and I'll paraphrase something like that, which you don't measure doesn't get better. Right? So if I can go and say, this is what I'm expecting. Now I have a quantitative metric for that. And the importance for it being open source is because everyone needs to get on board with it. So if I go and, and let's say commercialize it, and five people buy that product, that, that's fine, but you've now 
isolated yourself from the other 95%. So it's, it's almost like you've kind of created, you have the potential of creating lots and lots of different standards. The challenge here is to have, get as many people on board as quickly as possible so that you can develop better algorithms. So one of the advantages of HistoQC is that what's happened to us is I will go and train a deep learning model, let's say to do segmentation or, or identify where a tumor is. I'll train a model, the model will work fantastic on my personal data set. Someone else will go and say, can I use your model? Yes, I give them my model, results are very bad. Why are those results bad? I don't know. So then I say, can I see some of your slides? They send me some of their slides. Their slides look fundamentally different than my slides, right? Maybe they're much brighter or much darker. We know, and, and a lot of people put up numerous publications showing that there is, uh, deep learning is not robust, we'll say, to slides prepared from, from different sites. So a fair question would be to say, how can we address this disparity? One is to make better deep learning algorithms. That, and I think everyone's trying to do that. The challenge, I think, becomes pathologists want to know if they can trust certain results. How can we go and start to instill trust in medical doctors that this algorithm is going to work or that it's been tested appropriately? HistoQC can help with that because now we could say, I have trained my deep learning model using slides that have exactly these metrics, right? It is exactly this dark. It is exactly this much chemotoxin on stain. Exactly, not, not an approximation, but down to five significant digits. This is exactly what my data set looks like. Now, before you use my algorithm or use my model on your slides, I want you to use, your, use HistoQC on your slides. If your metrics are fundamentally different than mine, do not use my model. Don't use it because maybe it's going to work, maybe it's not going to work, but I don't know if it's going to work. That's an indication to me that you're now using it on data that's outside of what I have tested it with. That should immediately give people better confidence to say, oh, this person now is saying, let's, let's take a step back and proceed with caution. Maybe, maybe it will work, that, that would be great, but you should test it. You should test it and be very, very careful with it until it's fully validated. Previously, that wasn't a possibility because you would just say, here's my model, oh, it didn't work, and then go on with your life. Simply by having metrics allows us to now start going and doing these things. And I think the reason why it has to be open source is because everyone has to do this. In order for that to be successful, everyone has to go and start taking these measurements and releasing them with their models. So if you release a deep learning model that, let's say, segments glomeruli in a kidney, you should, along with it, release a summary of what that data set looked like in terms of quantitative presentation characteristics. So that you know if your samples are within that distribution, this is probably gonna work for you. If it's outside of that distribution, maybe don't use it at all, or maybe be very cautious about it. That only works if everyone has the ability to do that. If it's going to cost you, I don't know how much a quality control tool would say, let's, let's say $500 or, or, or 1,000 or 10, it doesn't matter. As soon as there's a barrier of entry to that, then there's a disconnect between the number of people that are going to use it because they'll say well why don't i just use the model and see what the results look like why should i bother to go through this quality control process if it's going to also cost me money as well as time by making it open source now everyone can just simply approach it and try it and i think that once you start walking on that path you see that the benefits greatly greatly outweigh the very minimal amount of time that it takes to to use that tool so i, I really don't see another way that this this could have worked and it's basically like the same exact problem that we see, if I can continue this rant, the, 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 the problem as well as with, for example, these whole slide image formats. Every company has their own whole slide image format. Guess what? As a researcher, that's the hugest pain that you can imagine. It's, people have had to go and write specific wrappers and try and maintain wrappers. Open slide is no longer being maintained. So now we go and, and get slides from someone and there's no standardization. We'll spend a day and a half maybe Oh, what format are these annotations in? Oh, this person uses XML. Oh, this company uses JSON. Oh, these people are using this type of XML schema. Oh, I need to rewrite my parser to go and do this. Oh, look, I can't go and load their files into my perfectly validated and established pipeline because it's a slightly different format. So all of that has created so much inefficiency and it created so many bottlenecks to collaboration and to research that it almost seems like the right solution is to show people what should be done. And that solution is make, make an open source answer. The open source answer is we can use HistoQC. It's free. If you like ideas, you can contribute other, other metrics and things like that too there. Now there's at least a rallying point. Now everyone can say, I used HistoQC. These are exactly my metrics. It cost me nothing to do that. These are exactly my metrics. 
On the other hand, say, well, I'm going to buy, let's say, a Philips scanner. Oh, but am I familiar with their SDK? Right? Then the conversation ends up becoming something that's completely unrelated to the problem that you're actually solving. I want to do computational research. I don't want to spend days writing parsers for file formats. That's, that's not interesting. That's not exciting. And, and quite frankly, I think it's, it's a waste of time. It's a necessary evil until we have some organization. And we've seen things like this throughout maybe even human history where we've seen there used to be, for example, uh, two, two different types of DVD formats. You might remember you had DVD R plus and DVD R minus, and some of them were the Philips ones and some of them were the Sony ones and you couldn't read the DVDs written in like all of this crazy stuff. The USB was a, another, everyone came out with their own little different adapters and it maybe remember in the eighties and nineties, everything had its own type of adapter. So, oh, my mouse has its own uh, power supply. This has its own power supply. This has its own power. Like it's just an, a crazy amount of added inefficiency. There's no other word for it. It's just inefficiency. And now you have one USB connector and you can charge your headphones. You can charge your phone. You can charge this, you can charge this, you can charge this because it was a, a viable standard that people were able to rally around. So as far as quality control is concerned, I think it has to be that. Other things, maybe there's more, more leeway um, and it'll take more time to figure out. But if you really want to have a fundamental impact in a quality control space, it has to be something that's so incredibly easy to use and so available to use that people realistically do not have a choice not to use it because it's really that easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can I use it? I want to, let's say I have a project with um, not so many slides, some slides for a project. Uh, I want to have the Histo QC metrics for this. I go to GitHub, where do I go? I'm going to put all the resources, all the paper and everything you're now telling the listeners about in the show notes so they can click and get it. Great. So, um, so there is a GitHub for that. Uh, first, I would recommend reading the paper to at least, uh, and it's a fairly short paper in uh, JCO CCI, uh, 2019. So that a quick a quick read there will will certainly help. I think there's a little bit of a, a, a disconnect. So the the people that would have to use it would have to have um, at least some technical experience um, because it is more of a we'll say a lower level tool as opposed to a higher level tool. So. If you're interested in using it, for example, I, I think you could probably install it yourself uh, and it will work on, for example, a laptop. You don't need any type of very sophisticated computer. Um, you should be able to run it just by going to the command line and typing the command that is shown in the, the documentation. I mean, it really should be that easy. I think we've seen that for, um, we'll say, pure pathologists that don't are, are not very technically heavy. It, it might be a little bit uh, too much, but there's 100% of the time people within their organization that are, are capable of doing it. The, the technical skills needed are, are really, we'll say, just slightly above uh, introductory. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, we have people on our side that can help as well. So when people don't know how to use it or it's not working properly, part of that, that NCI funding is for us to provide support. So people can reach out to us and we'll have, let's say, a screen share. We'll say, okay, now click here, do this, do this, do this, do this here. So there is even an opportunity, I would say, for people that have no idea how technology works to be walked through this to the point where they are um, able to go and at least process their slides using the standard pipeline. Of course, if they're interested in, in modifying it and using more, let's say, sophisticated features and that sort of thing, there is a little bit more of an investment in, in both the user's time um, to, to kind of fine tune the, the, the parameters and, and things like that. But for, I would say, routine H&E slides, the, the defaults that we provide, they seem to work really well. They seem to work really well. We haven't had uh, a lot of complaints in regards to the defaults. We've had questions about extending the functionality to, to other stains and things like that. Uh, we have a paper now currently in review where we've uh, employed HistoQC on a kidney slide repository that looked at um, silver stain, trichrome stain, PAS, and H&E. HistoQC performed admirably across uh, all of them. And we released as well configuration files for each of those stain profiles as well. So that was done by one of our PhD students. And this is kind of this idea of open source because again, he went and he did this work. He didn't have to change any of the source code. He only changed the configuration file. Instead of him keeping it private, we, we open sourced it. Now, if you want to use PAS stain, you can simply download that configuration file, click run, and, and potentially that becomes something of a, of a standard that we can start the, the conversation around. I certainly don't think that HistoQC is 
you know, the end all be all in a hundred years, if we're still using histo QC, we've probably failed somehow in our quality control uh, endeavor. But it's, I think it fills a very needed niche in the short term and, and has sparked a lot of great questions and great conversations where people say, maybe, maybe we should be, why, we, why aren't we? Wait, if it's digital, shouldn't we be doing digital quality control like every other science that we have? And the answer is yes. And finally, we have an opportunity to do that. So uh, let's say in the lab, you mentioned uh, one scenario with, where it's plugged in directly after scanning and mm -hmm. they already developed in this lab uh, metrics that alert them. Um, and uh, what I mentioned would be, okay, before I uh, start the project, I run it on my data set. Is there any other place where you would recommend plugging it in the lab digital image analysis pipeline? So I, what's interesting is I think that any any time that you scan a slide, you should you should use it, right? So mm -hmm. it's easy for me to identify when to use it because I just want to I imagine where the scanner is, and then I imagine the next box. If you imagine a workflow, that next box is is some type of quality control, mm -hmm. and a lot of scanners have some type of, of of quality control, but I don't think it's it's extensive. And the problem is is that no one those those metrics are not comparable. Let's say across facilities, across scanners, across that. So you really do need a, a let's say a unifying way that people people know what it is right because mm -hmm. there is and this kind of i guess goes back to our one of our initial discussions even if i tell you what histo qc does and you programmed it yourself you're likely to have a, a different implementation so you may say oh he used mean squared using this equation but in fact i use this equation so then you would still not have comparable statistics even though you think that we've implemented it the same way so by releasing it and connecting it all the time immediately after the scanner at least there is that that consistency across across sites and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think one thing worth mentioning as well that I find super interesting is you said you wanted to use it for a research cohort, uh, and that's that's really one of the main main places that we've looked at. It. So keep in mind that when you go and receive a thousand slides for a study, you don't necessarily use all one thousand slides. You'll look at some of them and say, oh, these five percent are so bad that I have to throw them away. Right? They're just so bad they have to be removed. Now, the, the interesting point is, is that our study that, that's being reviewed now, it seems that if you do that process with three different people and you give them the same set of a thousand slides, the 5% that they remove is not always the same, mm -hmm. right? And it turns out from, from our, our estimations that concordance can be as low as 0.4, right? Okay. Of, of which ones you think are of low quality, based off of three different readers. I was one of the readers and uh, postdoc that we worked with and a PhD student. So we all went and went through this manually, looked at all, I think it was about 250 slides, looked at all of them said, I think these are the bad ones and I think these are the good ones, right? And then we analyzed it, wow, 0.4, that's very poor. And this is, this is pre-analytic, this is even before you've done any type of experiment whatsoever. This is just in creating the data to go and do the experiment, already you have a huge variability. Imagine how much that impacts downstream experiments. It's a, it, 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 we're not even, people wouldn't even end up with the same data. And this is startling when you think about it in the context of the TCGA, where now you have 10,000 slides, everyone downloads the same slides, right? All the slides are freely available to everyone. Everyone downloads the same slide. I hope everyone does some type of quality control, even though reading some of these manuscripts, there's no guarantees that they do. But now, of course, when I read I a, a review of manuscript, I go and I look and say, did you do quality control? I know for a fact some of these are, are not suitable for computational analysis. So people are now starting to address that naturally in their papers, which I'm very thankful for. But then you have the next question say, well, if you do quality control and I do quality control, and I, you say that this is, this is the result of your experiment, can I reproduce your experiment if I don't even start with the same data? And the answer is probably not, because now you, you've imparted some bias in your selection of the good quality and the bad quality. So what we did then was we used HistoQC across the same cohort, and we had the same three readers do it again and look at the HistoQC metrics to identify which are the good quality slides and which one should be removed. Concordance jumped to 0 0.95, 0 0.96, so almost perfect concordance between these three readers simply by using a quantitative tool that allows you to go and say, oh, these are different than the others. These are not suitable. Let's remove them. So now we're at least starting with a much more similar data set that you're likely to have better reproducibility of your, your experiments downstream, mm -hmm. simply by using a free open source tool. Wow. Um, another thing that you're doing that I want our listeners to know about is your blog. 
tell us yes. a little bit about the blog. What's there? So and what's the profile? Who is it for? So initially, we published a paper in Journal Pathology Informatics in 2016, maybe, and it was called Deep Learning Seven Seven Use Cases, something like that. And all of the different challenges, and this was kind of when deep learning was starting to become popular. All of the use cases that we were seeing in our lab. I realized that you could solve using deep learning, which which I think has been well proven since since then. Do you incorporate deep learning in HistoQC, or is it uh, no, 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 no? Well, the challenge uh, the challenge with incorporating deep learning is that you have to train a model, and the problem is is that as soon as you train a model, you need to have associated input data from it, and if we go and use HistoQC across ten different sites, it's not obvious to me what that input data should be. I can't go and say this is the definitive ground truth of H and E simply because other hospitals will reject that notion. So instead, I'm HistoQC is, is using what I would consider first order image analysis and image processing uh, and image statistic techniques that are purely data driven. So there's no site specific component which allows us also to remove some variability because now if you train a model and someone else trains a model, how do I guarantee that those two models are performing the same? You can't. So then I have to perform the model. Unfortunately, if I have to train that model, I would have to train a model for breast tissue, brain tissue, prostate tissue, colorectal tissue. And how do I get all of this data? How do I ensure there's enough variability in the data? And then you kind of have this, this problem where now I need every single slide ever created in the world in order to train a model that's robust enough to address it. So we, we simply just avoid that to, to begin. And this is a super thing, a super important thing to mention because now I think the perception of image analysis is that the traditional image analysis is dying and now everything is going to be deep learning, everything is going to be training models and then you don't have to annotate, you can do unsupervised. I think like you just said, there are applications and use cases for different types of image analysis and uh, it's going to be continue, continued in parallel depending on the use case. I mean, keep in mind that that over the, if you look at the history of image analysis in general and, and deep learning and machine learning, there's kind of been a wave, right? So there was this, this time where uh, everyone was like, oh, neural networks are going to solve all the problems and, and, and they didn't. Uh, and then we kind of reverted back to more, <laughs> they didn't, shocking, shock, we're still here, still here. Um, and then we kind of reverted back to more handcrafted features and those types of things. And then now the, the, the flip is to the other side of machine learning and artificial intelligence, which, which is great um, because it does really solve a lot of the, the problems that, that we experience. Um, I think we're starting to see some of the limitations there. And I wouldn't be surprised if once everyone is kind of familiar with deep learning, machine learning, and, and we, we solve a lot of the basic problems. And, and those basic problems are things like cell segmentation, um, identification of, of where the tumor is on the slide. And these are all great things for, for deep learning that uh, I don't think a case can be made for using traditional image analysis techniques anymore for, uh, since we have the data and the, the use cases are, are fairly straightforward. We'll see, a, we'll see a transition, I think, once everyone has, has really caught up, right? So once the companies have built the tools and once people are using the tools and once the students are being trained with these concepts, that will have its place and then we'll be able to return back to a, a lot of the handcrafted and the image analysis components, which are still, I think, especially interesting uh, in the context of biomarker discovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is important. Uh, what about the blog? Tell us about that. Ah, yeah. So we published this JPI paper. So my, my notion for that paper was that it's possible to use a single repository and solve seven digital pathology problems. So the question was, can we, we, without tuning anything, without changing a single line of code, I would like to use the same deep learning architecture, the same training, not, not tweaking any parameters, oh, I'm gonna increase the learning rate for this use case. No, exactly everything the same across all of these seven use cases. And the seven use cases were exactly the things that we were struggling in our lab. So nuclei segmentation, uh, lymphocyte identification, mitosis identification, segmenting tubules and glands, um, identifying uh, invasive ductal carcinomas, um, and separating uh, different forms of lymphoma from each other, and identifying epithelial and stromal regions. So those were the seven use cases. And I, I wanted to know, is it possible now to use deep learning? We'll change the annotations, right? So the data coming in 
is different. On one, someone's annotated nuclei, and on the other one, someone's annotated epithelium, and on the other one, someone's annotated cancer region, like all of this sort of stuff. So the, the, the input is different, but everything in the middle is the same. And then everything on the end is the same. So we're going to use the same output generation scripts. So we're not changing anything. We're only changing the input data. And, and it turns out it works, right? Deep learning was, was really powerful uh, at that time. And, and, and those networks that we used were very unsophisticated compared to what's available now. So the patch sizes were small, 32 by 32. Batch normalization hadn't been invented yet. Um, I don't, maybe dropout had, had been incorporated. I think we used that. Yeah, we did use that in, in that paper. Um, so it was still very early stage deep learning time. And we were able to show comparable or state of the art results across all of those use cases without changing any code. So that created a, a case where we said, well, I wanted to, and I knew as soon as that worked that I wanted to go and, and, and release all of this, right? As soon as these experiments started to, to actually be successful, I said, wait a second, I have a general solution to all of these problems that, that are good enough, right? I'm not saying that we had F scores of, of one. You know, we didn't have 100% accuracy. We had great results. We had great results in three hours that would typically take us a year and a half to develop. So we mm -hmm. saw these, this magnitude of, of efficiency improvement. So what do we do with this information? It made sense to me to open source it, right? So I'm going to go in and release all of the code open source so that other people can use it. Fantastic. How do I go and tell people how to use the code? Well, code is, is pretty dense and it's not obvious how to use code. So usually you have readme files, something like that. I realized that that wasn't going to be sufficient in this use case because deep learning was so new that people didn't understand even the fundamentals of it or the, the concept of it. So there would need to be further explanations. It's very difficult to, let's say, embed images into a readme file in, in, in a GitHub page. So then I said, well, we'll start a blog. We'll put all of this stuff in the blog. So the first blog post itself was me writing seven tutorials, one for each of those use cases, explaining all of the design decisions made in collecting the annotations, how we validated it, what the steps were to rerun it, exactly the lines of code that you would need to copy and paste into the terminal to um, replace, uh, to, to reproduce those results. At the same time, we released all of the data uh, itself. So every single piece of data that went into that manuscript was released. That was the largest release at that time of, of any type of open source digital pathology data. We released the annotations as well. And people flocked to it. People flocked. I, I mean, there's that, that blog receives probably a thousand hits a month at this rate, just as people go and, and use it for reference to come back. Then at the same time, I realized that there, people were interested. I, the, 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 the positive feedback was, was insurmountable. It was just an amazing amount of positive feedback. And then I realized it didn't actually cost me that much to do that, right? And I realized at the same time that as I'm training students and, and we're teaching them, I'm teaching them the same things over and over again because we have a new student that doesn't know how to do these, these sort of things. So now my general policy has tried to be, if I have to explain something twice, I'll try and write it into a blog post. Because then that third time, I no longer have to explain. That third time I could say, here, go read this blog post. Let me know if you have any questions. There's usually some source code or, or things like that. At the same time, it also enables me to, uh, and, and it's, it, perhaps it's very selfishly, but it, it enables me to go and create standards for what I expect for my students. So for example, one of the things that, that I wrote is some code quite simple, that will go and take your results, your segmentation results, and it'll put them programmatically into a PowerPoint slide. So it'll take your, your original, original image, ground truth, output from your algorithm, and some comparison, some statistics, the name of the, the, the file that it was, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can go and just change two or three lines of code. My files are over here, and this is how big they are, or whatever the, the required changes are. Click run. And now you have a PowerPoint presentation that is exactly the way that I prefer to look at results. So instead of a student going in and let's say ad hoc giving me weird, weird file formats or, oh, here's this. I, I've gotten ones where, um, you know, and it's not their, it's not their fault. It's just what's easiest for them in that, in mm -hmm. that particular moment. And they don't have the experience yet to realize that someone else doesn't know what they've done or how to interpret what they've done. So you'll see I've gotten situations where the original images have one type of file name, the output has a different type of file name, and it took me one or two minutes looking at the file names to try and match up 
like, oh, this is the output from this image. And then it takes me another image, another minute to look through all of the masks to say, oh, this is the output. For the I mean, it, it's just not efficient. So I say, well, go and present your results like this. Now the students can go and read that blog post, blah, blah, oh yeah, this makes sense. They can go and now present their results like that. It's much more efficient for me because now all of the results that I see are in the same format. So I don't have to expend any additional mental effort to try and parse through each individual person's preference for presenting their results. Now, this is how you present your results and I would like to see it like this. Now it's easy for me. It's easy for them because once they're familiar with that script, they use it for every single project that they have. So it becomes much easier for them to, to go and look at. At the same time, I think it addresses one of your other points where you said, well, people will only go and use um, the, best, the best results, for example, in their paper or they'll cherry pick something like that. Well, if you have to manually go and click on each image and the output and have them on your screen and say, oh, this kind of looks good, and then you do that to the next image, I would argue that no one is going to do that for 100 images. It's just annoying. It's annoying and it's time consuming. On the other hand, if you can click one button and have a PowerPoint presentation made, now you just quickly scroll through with your mouse wheel. All of the information is perfectly paired. Now you're able to actually look at your entire data set and get a, a better feeling for how that algorithm is performing instead of randomly looking at it or, or cherry picking it. And you're able to go and convey that information to other people as well. So it's really these types of best practices that I think end up making it into that, that blog simply because it it's becomes more efficient, I think, for me, but it becomes more efficient for the students as well to, to be able to understand what they need to do in, in some longer form explanations of why those particular decisions were, were made. Mm -hmm. So it is more for computer scientists uh, that are doing digital pathology than the other way around for pathologists, although I have one uh, favorite post, which is how to download the images from TCGA data, because everyone's like, oh, TCGA, TCGA. I'm like, I want a couple of images just for illustrative purposes. How do I get them? And this is the post I'm going to link um, in the show notes as well. Uh, but from what I have looked at, I don't have too much use as a pathologist from this, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I think audience. you're right. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. So it's more geared towards what I would consider computational pathologists. Mm -hmm. So the, the people that are interested in, in loading the data and, and analyzing it that are familiar with Python, because there is my GitHub account as well that has the parallel of all of the code that's available in those, um, in those blog posts. But th there certainly are components that I think pathologists would be interested in. For example, we announced uh, the HistoQC papers available there, and we have um, a larger explanation that, 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 for example, we've discussed in this, this blog post, uh, this, this podcast, that is it necessarily appropriate for a manuscript itself that kind of gives a larger, broader vision of, of what may be possible. So there is some, I think, commentary on that. Um, but in general, I use it, I would say, as a tool to really codify my experience such that I can more easily and efficiently pass it on to the, that third person. And then once it's, once it's written, that third person is not a third person. That third person is, is a few hundred people mm -hmm. simply because it, it is freely available and publicly available. So I, I get emails from places I didn't even know that they did digital pathology. I had, a, I had someone email me, a, a bachelor's degree student from the country of Laos, email me and say, hey, I'm super interested in digital, but thanks, I downloaded the data, blah, blah, blah. You know, this isn't really working for me. How do I get, and I was like, this is, this is fantastic. This is exactly, exactly what, what I would hope for. Well, at the same time, I don't, I, I don't think every place in the world has sufficient access to, let's say, the infrastructure for digital pathology, but as well as the people that have experience with that digital pathology or the, mm -hmm. the mentors that have the experience to help, sa help them save some time, right? So it's, again, this idea of helping other people fail as quickly as possible so that they can succeed sooner. If you have no access to a, a pathologist, you're probably not going to advance as quickly. But if we can go and take some best practices, hey, you might wanna try this, or these have worked really well for us, here's some code showing how to do this and formalize that, now you're you're making that more available, right? So this again is this democratization of um, digital pathology for for other folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this great conversation. Um, as I said, I'm going to link every resource that we talked about uh, in the show note. If you have anything else, please feel free to send me, and it's going to be down there to easily click on. 
and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. For more great digital pathology resources, visit the Digital Pathology Consulting website and subscribe to our newsletter on digitalpathologyconsulting.com. After subscribing, you will get access to the free annotation guidelines, which will help you annotate slides consistently in all your digital pathology projects. Talk to you in the next episode.